Last time I was up here, it was uh, Father's Day, and uh, we were throwing Beanie Babies around. <laughs> so I, there's a few of the Beanie Babies here today. Kit's here, Mary Courtney, her mom, her brother. There's Cora, her dad, and Addie, and Miss Sue. You've all seen those Beanie Babies somewhere along. I'm just glad that they're here. So as Pastor was saying, uh, 2017 is coming, coming to a close, and uh, for many, it's been a great year. We've had uh, marriages, we've had uh, engagements, babies, grandbabies, grandpuppies. Uh, there's been um, a lot of neat things going on, new homes, new jobs. Uh, if you're a sport fan, uh, you know that Clemson was 13-1 and one over the last year, 2017, including the national championship, and one loss, which was to Syracuse. So I've had a great year. <laughs> Uh, politics, I don't know anything about politics, but some of you probably could shake your head yes or no for the year. Uh, I can say about 2017 politics that if nothing else, it has been interesting. But also for 2017, it's been tough. Uh, there have been deaths, there have been uh, uh, destructions in marriages, there's been just a turmoil for a lot of people over the year. And uh, for so many, it's a time when we just kind of wish we could push that year behind us and move forward. And, uh, but no matter how this year has gone for you, good or bad, the beginning of a new year is always associated with the promise of a new start, a new beginning. And isn't it great that we serve an awesome God who promises a new beginning each and every day? Today we're going to put a kind of an exclamation point on 2017. We're going to put, try to put a direction on the series that Pastor's been doing called A Place for You and uh, create that action statement, if you will. How am I going to take what pastor has been preaching in this past year and move it into that next year? So I thought I'd do is I'd tell a couple stories. We'd look at a Bible verse so you could say you went to church, uh, tell a couple more stories, and uh, then we'd kind of finish it up. Now, Sue, when you said that hour part, is that for everybody or just me? For everybody or just me? Just me? So we're not going to do the Bible part? No, just going to tell the stories. All right. So many of us start off that New Year's resolution or the New Year with a resolution. And uh, I thought I'd just throw a couple of these up and read them to you. I think they might be a little too small after I put them up on here. But these are resolutions from 2017. Uh, the first one was going to be just kind of like very simple. I just want to simply be able to remember 2017 until instead of 2016. Not a bad start. This next one, the guy says, well, I can't change life, but I could change uh, maybe the world. The New Year's resolution is that donuts will have no calories. Like that one? All right. Next one, this one, guy decides just to go a little bit bigger. He says, I'm on a New Year's resolution. I'm going to figure out how to squeeze a fourth and fifth meal into my day. And uh, we also want to, don't want to lose our, our, uh, our motivation. I like this. It says, uh, I love the new year, new me kind of thing, but I've only got two stamps away from a free meal at KFC. <laughs> I'd be silly to ruin that now. So. Uh, and this next one, I think it's the one of the, uh, this is the one where, oh yes, this is somebody who's just a little overwhelming. He said, this, this is Jen, she said, in New Year's resolution, I'm going to try to worry less, like fill that time with, oh God, what am I supposed to fill that time with? Oh, it's already going to be terrible. <laughs> And I, you can't see this, but she started worrying on December 30th. She it took like two, two days to get kind of started for it. And then the last one is, 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 is forget about resolutions. Just write out everything that you did last night and add the word stop to it. I was like, that. <laughs> of course, I wouldn't be up here if I didn't think we could do a little better than that. So I've entitled today's talk, and we're going to kind of whip through this, Old Man's Guide to New Year's Resolutions. And uh, stealing out of third, uh, what's her name? Third day. A uh, little twist on here. We're going to talk about signs. How do we get signs that kind of draw us to what that message might be? Uh, the miracles of that resolution that we pick. And then a little bit of a guide of the wonder of how we make it happen. So um, here's the roadmap. I'm going to go through this part real quick. But the roadmap just kind of give you a little history. And let's just skip to the history portion. I'm going to read this to you. This is written by Sarah Pruitt from the History Channel uh, in December of 2015. She writes that we first out, starting out with the, uh, those are the Babylonians. And um, I love that word. I know some people say that I mispronounce it, uh, that it should be like Babylonians, but I think Babylonians is so much cooler. 
And I can guarantee you that if you don't hear anything else today, the next time you see that word, you're going to be going, Babylonian. Oh, Babylonian. <laughs> the ancient Babylonians were said to have been the first people to make a New Year's resolution some 4,000 years ago. They were also the first to hold recorded celebrations in honor of the new year. During this massive 12-day religious uh, festival, the Babylonians crowned a new king and reaffirmed their loyalty. They also made promises to the god to pay back their debts and return objects that they had borrowed. We don't do that anymore, do we? And if the Babylonians kept their words, then the pagan gods would bestow favor upon them. If not, they would fall out of favor and nobody wanted to be there. Next came the Romans. And that crazy Julius Caesar, known for tinkering with calendars and adding anchovies to salads. Around 20 or 46 BC, he established January 1st as the beginning of the year, change of calendar. And January had a, sp a, a special significance for Romans because of Janus, uh, the two-headed god. I believe that Janus symbolically looked backward to what had happened in the year before, but also ahead to the future. So the Romans offered sacrifices to the deities and made promises to the good contact for the coming year. And then on to the Christians. This is the first day of the new year became traditionally the occasion for thinking about one's past mistakes and resolving to do and be better in the future. In 1740, English clergyman John Wesley, founder of the Methodism, created the Covenant Renewal Service, also known in some cases on, on New Year's Eve and New Year's Day as Watch Night. And this is what's done with, with reading of scripture, singing of hymns, and a spiritual alternative to the raucous celebrations that was going on elsewhere. But now in our day and age, and us, modern us, we're kind of back to the old uh, secular practice of making promises, not necessarily to God, but a lot of times just to ourselves. We have these self-improvement kinds of things. And that kind of me explains maybe why we're having so much trouble. This research uh, piece that's up here says that 45% of Americans say that they usually make a New Year's resolution, and only 8% are successful in achieving their goals. Doing that. Now, we don't need their research to do that. We can just go to a research project that I've been doing for the last 50 years, and that is that if you were to say you start making resolutions somewhere around age 10, 11, we'll say 12, that makes the math real easy. I'm 62, we started when I was 12. There's 50 years of making New Year's resolutions, usually about better health, better nutrition, more fitness. 30 years ago, my wife started to add resolutions to my life as well, and every year she says maybe she'll do something better for his thing. So I just want you to look that's 80 years of self-resolutions right there. So we can probably do better uh, than looking for things for ourselves. Another way to kind of put that is this, I can't believe it's been a year since I didn't become a better person. <laughs> That's easy what we're looking at. My daughter asked me this morning, are you nervous? And I said, no, I'm just cold. So if we focus on ourselves, we're really never going to be satisfied with the results. We'd have to move on to other things. So this is the message. This is the, the, uh, the message for the day. And I thank uh, Linda for putting this up on the, uh, the, uh, the music this morning. Our statement for this coming year is right here. It says, create in me a pure heart and renew. That's where that, that resolution comes in, that renew a steadfast spirit in me. So I'm taking that spirit and I said, I want that to be the focus of who I am in the upcoming year. Not me, but that spirit. And do not cast away from me your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Do not let that be removed from who I am, but that stays close and it becomes a focus of who I am in the upcoming year. And it's your Holy Spirit and your vision for me that will drive what I do in the resolution that I propose for the next coming year. So anyway, I think we'll get right into the pieces in here. Why do these things so? How do you make these things go so easily faster? Fold them or something? So the first thing we're going to do is we've got these three steps that I want to look at. One is that we're going to look for a sign. God, give me some sign that this, this resolution that you have for me is from you and not from me, that you want to have some peace in there. You know, and I talked about signs over and over again and... and uh, People are constantly telling me with my hearing loss that I should learn sign language. And I know I've rebelled over the years because I always say, why do I have to learn sign language? If I learn sign language and I come up here and I do my whole sermon in sign language, you're all going to be down there going, what? You won't have a clue what's going on. You all have to learn sign language. And when you're all speaking sign language, then I would have to learn sign language. 
But I've also found it to be a little bit confusing in some cases. And one of them is that some signs look a lot alike. So I'm just going to share a couple. Put your left hand out like this and take your right hand like this. If you take your, you take your right hand and you push back on the palm like this on the back, right? that is paper. Right? That's paper. If you turn it this way and you kind of clap like that, that's school. All right? If you turn it this way and you push it out, like that, that's fine. That's fine. Everybody knows fine. But if you take it and you grind it in like this, that's cheese. <laughs> so I look at these things, I'm like, what? Well, I'm uh, uh. anyway. That's a tough one. The one that just the one that just came in it, and this just I, I have a I have a little app that gives me a sign of the day. And this one came out and it just I looked at it and said, wow, that explains so much about my life. Uh, if you take, make a five hand like this, and you just sort of touch the side of your head and move it out, that's, that's father. If you did it off your chin, that would be mother. Things from below down here are female, this is male. So up here, this is father. If you do it twice, that's grandfather. This is your dad, and then the one more, that's grandfather. Makes sense, doesn't it? So this is your grandfather. Now, if you take that thumb and you bring it in like this as a B hand, and you do it that same thing too like that, that means crazy. My grandfather was crazy. <laughs> and that just kind of explains it. I look at him, pop up, pop, I, now I understand. He was, a, he was Italian, first generation Italian. He, uh, he settled in Pittsburgh and then he moved uh, his family to a suburb outside of Scranton. And uh, I spent uh, some of my informative years living with my grandfather. His nights were spent with his goombas out in the backyard drinking wine and playing bocce. I learned a whole different sign language from my grandfather, <laughs> some of which I can't share here. But I do want to show you how it gets just a little bit confusing. I'll teach you two more. Uh, if you want to say good morning to somebody, good is to put your fingers on your tip like this and then just lay it in your hand. All right? This is, this is good. All right? The day is represented by the horizon as your arm on here. So when the sun comes up, this is like a day. When the sun goes down, this is night. But when the sun comes up, that's the morning. <laughs> so if I say good morning to somebody and they're Italian, that's not a good thing. All right? Just... So you can put those in. So we just want to make sure that whatever the signs are, when they come to us, that we really have been thinking about, are they truly from a God sign? And I like to think of the God signs, and I've shared this with you before, but God tags him. I call them God tags. If something comes to me at 3 o'clock in the morning, as did this, this message, if it comes at 3, at 3 o'clock in the morning, it's not from me. God has woken me up and he said, write this down because you are going to do this someplace else. I have never woken myself up at 3 o'clock with a good idea. All right? So God is the one who's got his feast in here. And God also has that, that other little tag, I call that little sense of humor. And God's sense of humor with me, I think, is just great. I'm going to share this story. Some of you heard it again. But we're at a retreat in New Hampshire. Pastor is preaching. It's the, last, uh, the evening service. And he's, he's giving us a call. He's saying, God is going to speak to each one of you tonight. He says, here's what I want you to do. I just want you to turn around in your chair, kneel down on the ground, and fold your hands, close your eyes, and God is going to give you a new name. So I turn around, kneel down, I'm obedient, put down like this, and just like that, I kid you not, just like that, God says, your new name is Conqueror. And I'm thinking, this is awesome. What a great name. This is, just, this is amazing. Now, guys, when you go to a retreat, when you come home, what's the first thing your wife says? How'd it go? What'd you learn, right? I will come home if I say nothing, like, that's going to happen. I'm saying, this is something I can share with my beanie baby when I get home. So I get my book out, and I said, all right, here's my word, conqueror. And I start to write it, C-O-N-C, no, it's not a C, a C-O-N-K. Now, there's, I think there's a Q in there somewhere. So I'm going to say, God, this has got to be from you, right? <laughs> what a sense of humor. You give me a word that I can't even spell. You know, so I know that that message is from God, because if it were for me, if I had just sat down and said, oh, I'm going to call myself conqueror, I first of all would have given myself something I could have spelled. <laughs> and second of all, it wouldn't have been as eloquent as, as conqueror. It would have been something like, guy who snores so loud, he wakes up the dog. And that would have been my own name for myself. So these little signs from God, when God comes to you and he gives you your God sign, you're going to know that that message is for you.
Let's see what we got in here. Do we have a sign? Oh, so we want a sign from God. Is that what's up next? The sign from God? Yeah. Well, you did ask for a sign, so there's a sign from God. All right. So how do we know it's the right one? Where does this miracle come from? And uh, the next slide, it says there was a wise man who once said that we want to be part of something that is bigger than ourselves. And that wise man was Pastor Roland. That was back in November. Remember that? <laughs> All right. Back in November, Pastor Roland said we want to be something bigger than ourselves. That's what we've been working on. We want to be bigger than ourselves. I talk about Joe Ehrman all the time, Season of Life, a book. He says we need to learn how to love. We need to learn how to be loved. And we have to learn how to get something that's bigger than who we are. The answer is very simple then is we just choose a resolution, a resolution for God versus a resolution for ourselves. And once we've done that, then we get the miracle. So this next verse, you didn't think I'd make it all the way without giving you this one, right? The miracle is, is it got, that there's a greater love that has no one than this, that they would lay down their life for a friend, lay down who I am for somebody else. That's that reach. We've talked about this before and before. So I'm going to give you a little test. Take this little test with you, and this is called the once a month test. So if you pick a resolution, and it doesn't make any sense if you did it once a month, it's probably, not, it's probably for you. So, for example, I think I'll go to the gym once a month. I think I'll stop eating potato chips once a month. Probably not for me. But if I were to say something like, I think I will attend a board meeting for FCA once a month. Or I would make a donation to Martha's Kitchen, which you're already doing, once a month. Now what we're starting to do is we're really starting to build into that community. And we kind of just take a look at that message and we say to this, says, what is the message you have for me, God? If I were to do that just once a month, would it make a difference? I'm also on the board at Samaritan's House, and I'm finding that the board meeting alone is not enough. So once a month, I'm looking, is there something else I can do at Samaritan's House to make a difference in that one? That becomes our resolution. If you just take a look at this uh, congregation today, and I'm just going to do a quick math thing here. There's, what, 60, 85, 90, 125, 145, 150. 150 of you plus one watching on TV. It's 151. <laughs> we multiply that, uh, and we each did something a month. It would be 160 some month things a month. And if we did that times 12, it would be a whole bunch more than that. That's the impact that we can have if each one of us just reaches somewhere out and says where we go. In our bulletin, it's there every week, it says to serve. God created us to be the difference in our community. We can help you find a place in serving both church ministries and out in the community. Pastor has done a great job of inviting a lot of people here this past year, and there's plenty of places for us to kind of stick in. So the last thing that I want to, uh, to share with you has to do with this idea of how we kind of get to there. Is that wonder? Is that next? I may have skipped a couple in here. Yeah, wonder. So what is the wonder? How is the wonder? How does this make this exciting for us and we can make it work? Usually what happens is every journey that we get involved with have these four steps, and it's universal for these four steps. The first step is always early enthusiasm. So we get out there, we get really excited. Oh, I like what Dave said today. I'm going to go right out and I'm going to just join that. You get yourself out and you say, I'm going to go do it. The second step is what we call reality stinks. And that's where you say, those of you that uh, were on the mission trip down to uh, Guatemala, you got that early enthusiasm, you raised your money, you couldn't wait to get down, and you get, hey, you get down there and the first thing you know, it's 195 degrees out. <laughs> and you're like, really? This stinks. Right? But our responsibility through the Lord's message is that we're going to persevere. So we stick with that perseverance and we stick with it. And if we do that, if we persevere on whatever message it is that God has given you for the next year, if you persevere on that, you will have victory. I guarantee you that. The Bible verse that supports this is um, in Romans 5, 1 through, 5, 1 through 5. It says, therefore, since we have been justified through through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into his, this grace in which we now stand. And here's that early enthusiasm. And we boast in hope of the glory of God. Early enthusiasm. But not only so, but we also 
glory in our suffering. That's the reality stink part. Because we, we know that if the suffering then produces perseverance, perseverance is character, that better person in us, and character, hope, or another word for hope, is victory. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our heart through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Ties right back to what we started with, created me a clean heart. Do not remove your Holy Spirit from me. So opening that spot in here. So as we kind of come to a close here, just remember that you're going to pray for that New Year's resolution and wait for the sign. Pick a resolution that's going to make a difference in your community instead of yourself and where you can shine. I don't know if I said enough about this, but Pastor did this great piece about us where we talk about when we go out into the community and we shine our light into the community, what happens to that light? Oh, you were sleeping, right? It shines back on you. And if you're looking for a resolution that's going to boost you up, that light coming back on you is going to be that reward. It's going to be that victory for you. So imagine if you did that for 50 years instead of thinking about weight loss in the gym, the difference that you would make. So I'm going to share one last story with you as we can have the worship team, the prayer team start to come forward. Uh, this next slide, this is a scene in, uh, in Nicaragua. This is a village called El Pericón. It's way up in the middle of the, uh, up the northern coast up on, by Honduras. And uh, it's, a, it's an example of a, a personal story about these four steps. And one of the jobs that we had here is we were building the, uh, the, the uh, little um, cathedral that's on the far right-hand side, and then up above we were building a cistern. We're bringing water down to this area. One of the last jobs that had to be do done while we were there was uh, to bury this piece of pipe. And it had to be buried about 200 yards. Uh, nobody wanted to do the job. It just sort of sat there. Everybody kept looking at it and saying, well, we know it has to get done, but it doesn't, uh, it's not going to happen today. I had had kind of a rough day that day on some other things, and I decided, okay, I'm going to go and uh, be obedient to the Lord, and I'm going to take care of this. And so I got over there. I had a little bit of enthusiasm with me when I got it. I said, this is going to be okay. I'm going to go on there. Now, for those of you who have been down there, what 190 degrees does is it makes the ground about that hard. So I'm looking at this pipe, and I'm looking at 200 yards, and I've got one little spade in my hand, and I go to dig it into the ground. It's like stepping in cement. Nothing goes anywhere. So I get down on my hands and knees. The reality stinks. I'm digging in there, and I'm digging with a little, like, almost like a spoon, and I'm digging the dirt down about this far, and I'm laying this pipe, and it's going down this, and I'm just on my knees, crawling along, crawling along, crawling along, saying, Lord, all right, I'm just going to persevere. I'm going to persevere. I'm going to get to the end. I get all the way to the very end, and I'm just getting ready to put the last piece of pipe in, and the pipe goes off the ground and goes across this valley. And I got this little piece right here. I'm digging down and putting the pipe in, and if you take a look, I don't know if you can see this, but over here in the right-hand corner, see that bottle cap? That bottle cap is sitting in the dirt where I'm digging. I still have that bottle cap in my pocket today. I reached down, I turned that bottle cap over, and the word on the other side was victory. <laughs> the only beer company in Nicaragua. <laughs> I didn't care where it came from. At the end of that journey, the end of that, that uh, day of doing something for the village of El Pericón, I got a message from God that said victory is there. So I just encourage you, 2018 is all new year. It can be anything you want it to be. You get on your knees and you just pray. God will make you a conqueror. He'll take care of the things that are going on in your life. He'll just keep, he'll keep mending where he can. He'll keep working with you. And all he's asking you to do is turn around and give it back to the community. Just leave these doors today and look for one place where you can make a difference in that community. That would, be the, that would be the 2018 that you just won't forget. And please don't leave here today without prayer. If you need prayer for the end of this year, the beginning of next year, our prayer team will be down here in front. If you've never heard the message of Jesus Christ, today's a good day to come and talk to one of these people about it here. Pastor will be here as well. And as our uh, music team takes us into uh, song, you're welcome to just stand, join us in song, pray with the person next to you, just be thinking about where we go in 2018. Amen.